Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily video update for April 11th, 2024. We have an extremely fast-moving strategic situation with some dramatic developments, so I'm going to try and catch you up on it in, in this discussion in today's update. But in order to understand the threat we face today from global NATO, we have to go back to September 15th, 2021, when the Trilateral Security Alliance was consolidated between the US, Australia, and the United Kingdom, the so-called AUKUS Agreement, which was ostensibly to defend the Indo-Pacific region from alleged Chinese aggression. It was centered around the US and the UK providing Australia with some nuclear-powered submarines and overall enhancing the technological capabilities of the Australian military, including intelligence cooperation. Now, this was hailed as a coup for the United States, uh, which had failed under Obama to consolidate a trans-Pacific partnership to counter China. It was also considered a coup for the pathetic British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, as it led to the cancellation of a French contract with Australia to provide 12 conventionally powered submarines for Australia. And it was an advance for the five eyes in intelligence sharing that this would increase the capability of the essentially extended British Commonwealth plus the United States to not only keep an eye on China, but to uh, contain China. Now, lost in the euphoria over the deal is that the submarines will not be delivered until at least 2040. Uh, secondly, Australia will be giving up whatever sovereignty it has over its defense policy. And it's of marginal utility in a war because by that time, the time the subs are available, China is undergoing such a rapid rate of technological advance in its military that this will have minimal effect on the strategic military balance. But the beneficiaries in the short term are the military industrial financial complex of the US and the UK. It's also a boost for British prestige, and it's a move to build up global NATO. Now, this is part of an overall plan, which includes bringing in India, Japan, and South Korea into a Pacific NATO which is, of course, an oxymoron because NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And what does the South Pacific and the Indo-Pacific have to do with the North Atlantic? Well, this push for global NATO was advanced yesterday by the visit of Japanese Prime Minister Kishida to Washington for meetings with Biden. Kishida called the meetings an historic upgrade to defense ties. And there was discussion of defense cooperation what Biden called enhanced cooperation, which would interface with the defense coordination with Australia and bring Japan into military exercises with the UK. So overall, it's clear this is an upgrading of military cooperation. Now, it occurs at a time when Kishida's ratings are collapsing in the polls. According to the Japan Times, he's at the lowest level since the election. And the polls taken in March show his coalition below 20% in the Japanese polls, which means it's about the same as the, maybe a little worse than the Schultz coalition in Germany. Uh, the coalition governments throughout the world that are part of the NATO military industrial financial complex are all collapsing in popularity, including Biden. So it's not a surprise that this is happening in Japan. Now, I should note that not all the talk was about war. Kishida spoke of promoting a, quote, constructive and stable Japan-China relationship, unquote. Well, we'll see. Now, at the same time, there was a, a crushing landslide defeat of the ruling party in South Korea, the uh, People's Power Party of President Yoon, uh, lost anything close to a majority, uh, the opposition Democratic Party won more than half the seats in the National Assembly. In fact, with its coalition partners, it will control 175 out of the 300 seats, and that may even go up when the final votes come in. 
Yoon, of course, is a strong supporter of cooperation with the United States, bringing South Korea into this overall military alliance. So we'll see if there's any effect when the people vote. The, the effect may be the move toward color revolution in South Korea if, in fact, a new government comes in. Now, coinciding with Kishida's visit have been calls from various NATO officials for an upgrading of the military capability in Europe, a buildup of defense forces in order to, quote, defend, unquote, Ukraine, and to prepare for war with Russia. As you know, the Ukraine war was seized upon by the military industrial financial complex to have a huge shift of government spending from areas such as healthcare, infrastructure, education, and so on, to military spending. And the U.S. defense budget is now officially closing in on $1 trillion a year. When you add in the black budget and everything else, it's probably closer to $1.2 to $1.4 trillion. And this is for what? This is for Ukraine. It's for uh, demand for another $14 uh, billion for Israel. It's a war party building up for more war. Now, as NATO is pushing this, let's remember what happened in November 2019 when French President Macron, who seems to be uh, on, on uh, his sane side at that point, described NATO as, quote, brain dead, unquote. <clears throat> now today, as he's calling for possible deployment of NATO boots on the ground in Ukraine, if he were to follow this through, then perhaps we should conclude that he's the one who's brain dead. But wait a second, Macron just did something different. And don't expect a string of consistent principle positions coming from Macron. At the same time, he's provoking a worse crisis with Russia by calling for boots on the ground. Uh, he is now working with leaders in, in the Southwest Asia to try to get a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, on April 8th, Macron co-signed an op-ed in the Washington Post with Jordan's King Abdullah and with President el-Sisi of Egypt, in which they clearly called for an immediate permanent ceasefire in Gaza, which includes a return of all hostages, escalation of humanitarian assistance, and an end to Israeli settler violence, and also importantly, a two-state solution to ensure peace and security for both Palestinian and the Israeli population. Now, with Macron, as I said, there's no evidence of, of consistent principled approach. But it is important that the pressure is growing on Western leaders to stop the slaughter in Gaza. Now, Including the idea of a two-state solution raises the question, how do you do that? How do you ensure economic cooperation that will allow the Palestinians to have secure lives as well as guarantee peace and security for Israel? Well, it requires an economic component, one which provides mutual benefit. And that's only available with the proposal of Lyndon LaRouche for his oasis plan. The idea of desalinating water, uh, a cooperation which would include new canals from the Mediterranean to the Dead Sea and uh, from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea, which would include the uh, nuclear plants that would desalinate the water and green the desert. This was part of the original Oslo Accord, not specifically, but the idea of mutual benefit was key to it. The problem was that there was no intention <clears throat> to follow this through by the Western governments. So to, on this Saturday, the Schiller Institute will be sponsoring a conference, which will include people from all over the world, from different governments, ambassadors, think tanks, who will be discussing this idea of the two-state solution dependent on an OASIS plan. And also presenting it at this conference will be Helga Zepp LaRouche, who's been promoting the idea of a new security and development architecture for several years now. And Jason Ross, 
will give a presentation on how the OASIS plan will work. So at the, the moment as well that you have the drive for global NATO with the Japanese visit to Washington, there's a better idea which has also emerged. The former Taiwan leader, Ma, has just concluded a, a visit to China, which he had during which he had a meeting with President Xi Jinping. What they spoke about was peaceful cooperation, respect for the legacy of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who was the leader of the Chinese revolution at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, which was modeled in Dr. Sun Yat-sen's ideas on the Lincoln Transcontinental Railroad Project, which actually had in it the seed crystal of what's become known as the Belt and Road Initiative, the high-speed rail system in China, and so on. So they're having this kind of discussion, along with increasing people-to-people -people relationship between Taiwan and China. That's a better idea than sending battleships, nuclear submarines, and building uh, new, uh, military maneuvers to counter China. It's the idea of diplomacy, and that's what's needed. Uh, so tomorrow's Friday, I'll be taking your questions. Send them to me at harleysch at gmail.com.